Hi everyone, thank you for spending time with me today and welcome to my e-commerce and alternative selling methods webinar. My name is Christopher Garcia and I'm the business development specialist at the SBDC at UNM Valencia campus. I created this webinar great off of, uh, based off of a great document called Selling Without a Store by Tamara E. Holmes and you'll receive a copy of that article. Let me move to the next slide. My contact information is on the screen and a PDF of the slides will be emailed to you following the presentation. Uh, let me actually send you the link in the chat right now so you could access the follow-up email. Because I know I have some eager beavers on the line. And you should be able to access it. I'm going to chat it out to you all right now. And if you uh, are able to open that link properly, would you please send me a chat or give me a thumbs up or something like that? So I know you're you're able to access that link. And then once I email it, you won't be able to access that link anymore, but you'll have it in an email. Before we begin, let's over, go over some webinar ground rules. Everyone on the call right now is muted, so don't worry about background noise. Only I have to worry about background noise. And there's a feature to raise your hand, and some of you have already used it, but I'll use it throughout the webinar to make sure everything's going right and flowing. Uh, and just to make sure, you, and if at any time during the webinar, um, something's going wrong, my slide, I'm on the wrong slide, uh, you can't hear me, you can't see me, uh, raise your hand for me so I know that's like the, the indicator that everything's gone wrong. If you have any questions, can you please type them into the Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your screen? In fact, just to make sure everybody knows how to use the Q&A and make sure it's working properly, would you put a hi, hello, how are you in the Q&A for me? Hi, Toby. Hello, Sandy. Hello. Rose. Hi, Nico. Hello, Seth. Perfect. And I see a hand raised. Frank, if you're having any issues, would you just send me a chat? And I'm getting a lot of chats saying that the link worked, so I'm very happy to uh, hear about the link working. Oops, and I went too far. There we go. So thank you to everybody, and hello. I want to welcome everybody to the webinar. So thanks for putting the hellos into the um, Q&A for me. I see some new people just joined our meeting, so let me chat over to everybody the link to view the follow-up email before it actually turns into an email. I see some highs in the chat. Hi, William, and hi, Seamus. I'm glad you were able to join us, Seamus. And I don't see any hands raised right now, so it looks like we're doing pretty good. And every time I click, it looks like it's advancing my slides. So please don't let me make you motion sick. <laughs> with my slide advancing. This is a pretty dated slide for webinars, but I, I want to use this opportunity to welcome you uh, to our webinars. We have a big webinar offering. Some of the ones that I want to highlight that are coming up, we have the sales and marketing strategies webinar coming up tomorrow, and that's from our uh, director in Roswell, Scott Booker. We have three webinars coming up in March related to our other services we offer. So the Technology Commercialization Accelerator is gonna have a webinar explaining what they do. The Procurement Technical Assistance Center is gonna have a webinar explaining what they do. And um, the International Business Accelerator, those are all programs under the uh, NMSBDC bubble. So if you're interested in those programs, wanna find out more, I wanna ask some questions, please attend those webinars in March. And hello, Frank. Perfect. 
And you registered for this webinar already, so you know how to register for webinars on our website at nmsbdc.org. Here are the objectives and agenda for this webinar. I'll explain how the SBDC can assist you, introduce you to a marketing plan, introduce methods for taking your business online or selling in another way, and provide practical resources to assist your business with an online presence. It's a lot to cover in one webinar, but I think we're all up to the challenge. So bear with me, you guys. Here's the graphic uh, of our center locations throughout New Mexico, and there's probably gonna be a center near you. The mission of the SBDC is to build skilled entrepreneurs and strong businesses by offering no cost confidential business consulting and lower no cost training events like this one. You'll notice a small blurb at the bottom of the slide, and this is a disclaimer for our stakeholders, the Small Business Administration, and also the state of New Mexico. And now I'm gonna tell you more about the SBDC in the next few slides. Let's talk about the services of the SBDC. We offer two major services, again, confidential business consulting and lower no-cost business training. And there are no limits to how much no-cost counseling you can receive or how many training events you can attend. We have centers throughout New Mexico, so there'll be one close to you. And if you look at the graphic in the upper right-hand corner, it shows what we do. Renew, grow, launch, and start up small businesses. We welcome you to our statewide trainings again and to participate in your centers, webinars, or workshops. So everybody throughout New Mexico has a different center and those centers offer workshops or webinars catered to the needs of their area. This slide shows what we expect from our clients. My fellow business advisors and center directors want you to succeed. So you'll be assigned homework or further research. So please do the work necessary to succeed. We can't make decisions for you or offer tax or legal advice. We can only connect you to the information you need to make educated decisions. And part of making educated decisions is working with licensed professionals like attorneys and accountants. And I'll show you a, a good resource to find an attorney. And if you need a list of um, local CPAs or accountants, uh, I'll show you a, I might be, I might have time to show you a data tool that we use for market research. It's called uh, Data Excel and we could pull lists in any area, any zip code, um, and any NAICS code, which is the profession. Perfect, let's go on. Finally, I wanna remind you about important surveys we send out as part of attending these trainings. Everyone who registered for this webinar received an email from uh, so I believe it's from Anna Lena saying in anticipation of the upcoming e-commerce and alternative selling methods webinar event you have registered for, we would like to collect some preliminary information from you. And with this information in hand, we can tailor the course material to better fit your needs. So I wanna see just by a show of hands, let's look at our participants and let me chat over that link once again to the follow-up email that you could access the email until, um, I send it out. So let me see by a show of hands, how many of you received the pre-webinar evaluation? Okay, good. And if you didn't receive the pre-webinar evaluation, please look in your spam or your junk folder. Uh, sometimes our emails have a habit of going in there, especially if they're a mass email to say everybody who is gonna attend this webinar. You'll receive a survey after this webinar. Please do the post-webinar survey. Um, those surveys are part of our uh, requirements to the Small Business Administration, and we do value your feedback on, on those surveys. So please submit those to us. So now let's get into it. Let's talk about the marketing plan. Why is the marketing plan important when changing or adding selling methods? It's because online sales is all about identifying your target or any type of sales, not just online sales, is about uh, all about identifying your target market or markets, analyzing your product or service offerings, creating a profitable pricing strategy, and successfully distributing your products and services. Oh, and don't forget effectively promoting your products and services. So on the slide you see identify your target market, that's the first part of a marketing plan. 
and then addressing the four P's, product, price, place, promotion. Then we create benchmarks, and then I'll show you some further learning. So let's dive into each of the, the different aspects of the marketing plan. Every activity you do in your business should align with your target market or markets because these are the customers most likely to purchase your products, aka those customers you don't mind spending advertising dollars on. If you think everybody in the United States is your target market, think again. You'll most likely go broke promoting your product to everybody in the United States, so create a perfect customer in your mind, then describe him, her, or it. And uh, you could have more than one target market. And whenever we're talking about creating this perfect customer in your mind, they uh, often refer to that as an avatar um, for your target market. I'll also show you a great research tool offered to you at no cost by the SBDC uh, and later in the slides. So in the example I'm gonna use throughout this presentation is a, a women's clothing store in Berlin, and it's actually a Western wear clothing store. So say this clothing store wants to take their business online because sales are down. Their ideal customer, according to our research tool, uh, are women with household incomes of about 100,000 or more who purchase clothing and shop online. If the clothing uh, this store sold was Western wear, uh, you might look for women with interest in bull riding, farming, country music. And if your products were modeled after a famous country music singer, you might target those who listen to Taylor Swift. And I had to say Taylor Swift because I'm a Swifty for sure. Now that we've identified our ideal customer, we can tailor the products or services to their needs and wants. And that research tool I talked about uh, suggests the most popular products in women's clothing are accessories tops, bottoms, dresses, and outerwear. I've all, uh, in this example, the store has also been selling products through their storefront, so they know what products are hot sellers, high profit items, and are unique to their store. It's important to keep your online inventory lean because you are charged per posting, per photograph, and per sale. In some cases, sometimes you have a general business account and that's uh, covered in that account, but there's a fee associated with it. It's also very time consuming to photograph items, write descriptions, post them online, accept orders, ship, and handle returns and exchanges. So choose your uh, products wisely and profitably. Price is also a very important factor in online sales. You may have low, lower overhead when selling online, but you have other costs to think about like posting fees, payment fees, monthly subscription fees, yearly website fees, website or online store maintenance, and time for fulfilling orders, time for customer questions and emails, and time for returns and exchanges. It also entails navigating through websites, online marketplaces, and payment processors. So ask yourself, do you have the skills you need or do you have to hire somebody? There may be other online sellers selling the same products as you for more or less. So research the selling price online. And there are two common methods for setting a selling price, cost plus method and market pricing. If you have a unique product, you can set a price by figuring the cost and adding a markup, that's cost plus. And if you sell a common product, you can research the selling price on online marketplaces, by visiting store websites or by doing a Google shopping search. And typically if you have a common item, you're buying from a distributor and they have a suggested retail price. When you're selling on these online marketplaces or through your website, remember people are finding you based on the price you charge. And if you're a big price leader, that's gonna bring people to your website and they'll find you first, most likely. So we're selling online, so was why, why is place or distribution important? It's because we have more choices than ever for selling products online and fulfilling orders. You can choose to sell your products from your own website, you could use an online marketplace, offer pickup and delivery if you have a storefront, or use a third-party app like the Amazon Hub. And I thought it's pretty cool here in Los Unis where I'm at, uh, the uh, Amazon Hubs at uh, All Subs. So you could get your chimichanga or your, or your popcorn chicken and, and also pick up your packages. After figuring out our product price and place, you can think about promotion. But don't go right into promotion when you think about a marketing plan. There are more ways to promote your business than ever before, and some common methods are blogging, creating a website, personal selling, social media marketing, 
word of mouth and collecting reviews for your website or your storefront and other media like print media. When picking a promotion method, keep your target market and budget in mind. Some interesting ways to promote your product online include paying or giving free merchandise to bloggers or vloggers. That's called influencer marketing. Uh, and I like to give the example of unboxing videos or uh, these lifestyle experts uh, that, uh, especially with women, they, they love to do videos about putting on makeup. And oftentimes people follow those uh, makeup tutorials and people will send those people products um, for free so they could just promote their product while doing their video. You could pay for ads on social media. And I'll show you a little bit, if we have time, I'll go into that a little bit further. And uh, most importantly, you could claim your business's presence on um, Google My Business, which is free. And they also provide you with a free, very simple website. And I'll uh, show you a little bit about that. For the, the example of the Women's Western Wear store, you might consider sending a YouTube lifestyle expert some merchandise to promote that merchandise on their video. You could use Facebook uh, Boost to target uh, women with our selected interests, interest in farming, country music, shopping online, uh, or you could target them in places where Western wear is popular. Or you could send a postcard to repeat clients, letting them know that you have an online store. After making those decisions, think of promotional goals like reaching 100,000 viewers on your Facebook ad, track the results, and calculate your return on investment. So if you spent $100 on a Facebook campaign and you reach 75,000 viewers, the cost per viewer is less than a penny. And I think that's a pretty good campaign. And the mark, I do a marketing webinar, I usually do it in July, and I base it off of the SBA's Marketing 101 lesson. I have a link to it here. Uh, my links often don't work on my computer. That's, that's not to say they won't work on yours. But uh, let's go to that follow-up email, the link I sent out. And let me see where I have that SBA's Marketing 101. Let's see if I sent a direct link to the SBA's Marketing 101. Yes, I did. So the links work on the follow-up email, just not on my slides, typically on my computer. So uh, I based my marketing webinar off of the Marketing 101 uh, lesson on the SBA's website. If you want to take this lesson, it's available for you for free on demand anytime you want. Um, it goes over the marketing plan just as I presented it, finding your target market, the four P's of marketing, creating benchmarks, tracking your results, and analyzing your outcomes. And they have a great, great worksheets. Let me um, make sure everybody's seen that. I don't think everybody's seen that. So here's the, and the link is in that follow up. Here's the SBA Marketing 101 uh, lesson. And here's the documents that were the worksheets at the bottom of the slide. The two I recommend you review and use are the Marketing 101 Checklist and the Marketing 101, A Guide to Winning Customers. These are the two uh, um, of the best worksheets for gathering your marketing ideas that I've ever seen. So please take advantage of those. Let's go back to our slideshow. And just, uh, okay, I see a hand up. Are you, uh, raise your hand for me if you guys are seeing the marketing plan slide on the screen. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, oh, the marketing plan is the biggest part of, of doing this. So before you do any sort of online sales, do a little bit of market research, it'll help you tremendously. Okay, perfect. So let's talk about selling online. Many people think it's easy and less expensive, but that's not always the case, let me tell you. Um, you must research your options, fees, and staffing to make sure you have the time and manpower to successfully sell online. There are two options for selling online. You could sell directly from your website, uh, and the most website builders have a third-party uh, 
add-on. It's like a online marketplace. The big, the biggest example I could think of is Shopify. If you use Wix, they have Wix uh, uh, online store. Or you could use a marketplace. The traditional ones we think about are Amazon, Etsy, eBay. The pro of selling from your website is you save on your marketplace fees. And these fees run about 17%. The con is that you're doing all of your own marketing, search engine optimization, web maintenance, you're tracking orders on your own, and you're taking on the liability of processing and storing sensitive data, like credit card information. Using online marketplaces is easier because they process payments, track orders, create policies, and market the products across the web and to their existing customers, and they have an established clientele. So if you've ever ordered anything from eBay, Etsy, or Amazon, you probably get constant emails saying, you might like this too. <laughs> and usually I do. If you don't have a website already, you have to create one. Whether you use a web designer or an online website builder, there are three components to every website. The domain or the web address, the code or what we see, and the host for putting your website online. All these have costs associated with them requiring monthly or annual payment, maintaining your accounts, and you could have different providers for your domain, your code, and your hosting. Um, or you could have the same provider for all of them. It just depends. But they'll all have fees associated with them and take time. When opting to sell online, ask yourself if you have the processes and staff to successfully sell online. There must be somebody to list items, change prices, photograph items, write product descriptions, maintain a website and or an e-commerce profile, return customer emails, fulfill orders, ship orders, and handle returns and exchanges. Each marketplace is different and you could use one or many, but they all require time. And like one of my favorite bands says, your garden will never grow unless you bless it with your time. Fees run about 10%, uh, not 10%, 17% for product listings and payment processing. Some marketplaces have monthly fees when using a business account. Uh, they may charge you for adding videos, extra photos, or paying uh, most, all of them charge for uh, SEO, search engine optimization. So when uh, you want your item to appear first, when somebody types in, say, uh, women's Western wear, you could pay to have your store, your product appear first. And that's... Um, the search engine optimization or keywords, some of them call them keywords. So make sure you're only doing what you're able to handle and afford. And don't waste your money posting across all e-commerce sites or using an e-commerce management software, if, say you're only selling 10 things per month. And remember, keep the interest of your target market or markets in mind and use those distribution channels that appeal most to them. And let me, sh and I included uh, links, let me make sure I'm let me open up that follow-up email. And if you didn't get, uh, you might have joined after I sent out the link, but if you didn't get the link to see the follow-up email before I send it out, uh, send me a chat and I'll make sure to chat that out to everybody again. But if you look here under e-commerce, I put um, links to the informational websites uh, to the biggest marketplaces. So eBay Seller Center, they have a center teaching you just how to sell on eBay. Etsy has a seller's handbook. They probably have the best one that out of all of them. Uh, and it's general, so it goes across all of them. It gives you best practices. And it's nice to look at and easy to use. Uh, there's an article, Answers to 20 Common Questions about selling on Amazon Business and start selling on Amazon for an individual. Remember, there's individual accounts and then there's business accounts. So make sure you pick the account that works best for you. If you pick an individual account, you're operating as a sole proprietor. If you pick a business account, typically you're operating as an LLC a corporation, but you could be a sole proprietor and have a business account too. Really the major difference they ask for is they ask for an EIN number or um, your uh, federal tax ID number. So let's go back to our slides. So here are some popular e-commerce sites, and all of us may know about the first three, Amazon, eBay, and Etsy. 
There are many options vying for your money, so choose your marketplace or marketplaces very carefully and always keep the interest of your target market in mind. Since online marketplaces make more money as you sell more products, the bigger ones have great learning resources and customer service, so keep that in mind. In the follow-up email, I included links, again, for those, uh, the major um, online marketplaces have great portals, educational portals. They also have great blogs. I like, I follow Shopify's blog, and uh, they have great blogs about what should I sell online, what's hot online. Uh, they have a um, podcast where they talk to entrepreneurs who have done well on Shopify and just pick their brains about what, how, how they started their business and, and what's working well for them. So uh, if you sold mass-produced product, uh, mass-produced, say, women's handbags, Amazon might be a good option for you. If you sold vintage women's clothing, eBay might be your main portal of distribution. And if you sold maybe hand-knit women's cardigans, Etsy might probably be your best bet. Remember, keep that target market in mind. Sites like Shopify are e-commerce marketplaces that offer web design services. Shopify actually works with um, Weebly. They've teamed up. So if you want to create a store and a website all in uh, one shot, you could uh, create the website on uh, Weebly and then add the online marketplace store, which is through Shopify. Large WYSIWYG, which stands for what you see is what you get. Website builders, and these are things like um, Weebly, WordPress, um, Wix, um, GoDaddy, Bluehost has web design software. They offer e-commerce apps that like stores, like I mentioned, like Shopify. Uh, Wix has their own, and they also work with other apps. WordPress has a lot of, uh, uh, works with a lot of different apps, and Weebly works um, particularly with Shopify. Okay, perfect. When selling online, product photography is vital to your success. And as you can see from the image on the left, it has bad lighting, it isn't very attractive, versus the picture on the right that has good lighting and photo effects added. The difference speaks for itself. That bottle of Clamato almost looks angelic. Um, if you don't have experience with product photography, take a look at the article I included in the follow-up email. Let me bring up that um, follow-up email. And I put the articles here. The Definitive DIY Guide to Beautiful Product Photography and the Beginner's Guide to Product Photography. And had I read those before I started selling on eBay uh, and Etsy, I probably would have saved money because I bought a, a really cool light studio thing and it cost me a hundred bucks. And uh, they showed me how to do it with a piece of white uh, poster board from Dollar Store, right? Uh, and I could have saved some money there. And then take a look at Shopify's blog. They have a great blog. If you don't, uh, if you don't want to do the photography or you are an experienced with product photography, I included a link for Fiverr. Let's see if this link wants to work on my computer today. Fiverr is uh, like an online database of independent contractors who will offer fee for service type things. And I just typed in product photography and I found a lot of cool um, experts in product photography offering their services at pretty low prices. Other websites like this include Upwork and TaskRabbit. And I find that if you need something done, uh, and you don't want to do it yourself, you don't want to hire somebody, you want an independent contractor to take care of it for you. The sites like this are pretty cool. And they, I look at the pictures that they take and I think, oh my gosh, I would never have thought to present my product in that way, like that or with the oranges there. You could also contact a local photographer. I'm sure they're hurting because of uh, things that have happened with COVID over the years. And you could also use a stock image website. So let me show you that. The stock image website example I like to use is Adobe Stock. The person who used to coordinate our webinars, um, uh, Leslie Everson, she's actually our advisor in Hobbs now. Um, she turned me on to this website, it's pretty cool. So you could type in some, say I always use the example of can opener. I tried to find the least controversial and boring uh, thing I could think of. 
So if say you need a quick photo, you want to put a photo of a can opener on your website, you don't you want to something that you could just use quickly. You could get you could license these photos to use on a website, you have to pay for them. Uh, you could also get a subscription to this service and they have a free trial. But uh, you can't just steal a picture of a can opener, sadly. You can't just go to Google and Google a can opener and steal whichever picture you like. So these are different options for using photos on a website, using photos on social media, and using uh, photos for your uh, online marketplace. You could, if you're, if you say you distributed can openers from a special can opener company, oftentimes they have uh, stock photos you could use. So ask your distributor. Um, and I'll show you how to do a Google search to find photos you could use in uh, maybe advertising online stores or your website, but they're not gonna be the best photos. Other than Adobe Stock, there's Pixabay, um, all kind, let's see, let's see if I could find them. I have to give you three. Shutterstock is a good one. Uh, if you have a website builder like Wix or Weebly, they often have stock photos already in there iStock, Getty Images, Deposit Photos. There's a bunch of online uh, uh, stock photo providers. So just choose yours based on what kind of photos you need. I find that if I use a WYSIWYG website builder, GoDaddy, Wix, Weebly, uh, they have a stock photo library and you could use photos from their uh, library. So if you write a blog, say on Wix, you could use photos uh, for that blog from that database. And let me show you how to do that Google search for can opener. And we do the images and we see all these beautiful images. We can't just take one and put it on our website or in our advertising campaign. If you want to find images you can use, you could go to uh, Tools, Usage Rights, and Creative Commons licenses. And these are most likely the photos you'd be able to use in an advertising campaign for free. Not guaranteed, but uh, you may be able to use them. And they're usually not very good. So just keep that stuff in mind. Let me bring back our slides. Let me check our chat real fast. Oh, Unsplash, I, I got a chat. Fernando says, Unsplash is a great free stock photo website. Uh, yeah, that was actually recommended. Uh, there's a, a woman who does our uh, conference for us. Her name's uh, the URL doctor, URL doctor. And she actually recommends Unsplash a lot too. So thank you for that, Fernando. And now here's writing a compelling product description. And I included links in that follow-up uh, email that I'll send out. You could view it on this link until I send it out. And I included two links for how to write a com compelling product description and nine ways to write product descriptions and inform and persuade your customers. These are two of the best articles I've seen on writing product descriptions. It was one of my least favorite things to do when I would sell online other than photography. Um, it takes a little bit of creativity, time and effort, but I put an example of a horrible um, product description that's from a private seller on eBay and a description that's actually from shopchuka.com, which is a, a distributor of shoes. So there's an example of good and bad one. The one on the top is from a private seller on eBay. The one on the bottom is from shopchuka.com. The bottom description is appealing to their target market's needs and wants. It's very descriptive and it uses keywords that increase search engine optimization. And keep those things in mind when writing uh, product descriptions. There are lots of opportunities to better sell products with great descriptions on sites like Amazon, eBay, and Etsy. I've noticed that many sellers on Amazon may not speak English as their primary language, so things often get lost in translation or they don't provide the buyer with the information they need or want. For example, I was searching for a, a borosilicate pitcher, that basically a Pyrex pitcher 
where I could heat water in the uh, in the pitcher and make iced tea without having to um, uh, switch dirty a bunch of dishes. So um, I was looking for this borosilicate pitcher on Amazon, and I the, everything was in milliliters. Uh, I, the, I'm, we're not met on the metric system here in the United States. I don't have a, any idea what 100 milliliters looks like. We work in quarts, so I wanted a two quart pitcher. So if I had found a listing that said two quart borosilicate pitcher, uh, I would have probably uh, purchased that one right away instead of having to go through about 50 different um, descriptions to find out what I needed. Always keep your target market in mind when writing the descriptions. And these happen to be women's rainbow boots. So think about what attracts a woman to these boots, uh, where they'll wear these boots and about their buying behaviors and interests. Also use compelling keywords related to your products. And the keywords uh, that they used were waterproof, leather, rubber, comfortable, durable. Uh, Chuka used uh, sleek, plush, waterproof, rubber outer sole, self-cleaning and rainproof. So if somebody typed in rainproof boots, these boots would probably come up in their search. Okay, now that we talked about selling online, let's discuss pop-up shops and flea markets. I group these together because they have many of the same requirements. They just cater to two different markets. Pop-ups cater to a high-end market and flea markets tend to cater to a more general audience. Pop-ups are a lot of work and take lots of planning because you have to follow state and municipal, state, municipal and county licensing requirements, get proper inspections, uh, purchase insurance, which is optional but vital, and it takes a lot of market research and planning. Pop-up shops are usually used by established brands and are great ways to take your online product to a storefront, test a new product or product bundle, and test a new location or a demographic. So let's take a deeper dive into permitting, looking at the SBDC at UNM, Val UNM Valencia's Quick Start Guide. So let me show you that, that where that is in the follow-up email or the link to the follow-up email. It's the very first link. Not now. Let's make that bigger so we could see. And the regulations in most municipalities or counties for temporary vendor permits. So remember, this is a pop-up shop. You'll only be in a certain area for a week, maybe a day. Uh, they were created in the 1910s and 20s and governed businesses like revivals, traveling carnivals. I'm sorry for that. Let me go back to that email. There we go. Tra they are tra uh, revivals, traveling carnivals and circuses and door-to-door -door sales people. So this shows you how long it's been since uh, most municipalities, counties have thought about um, mobile businesses, online businesses. So whenever you look at this quick start guide, it's everything you need to, all the quick things you need to know about the basics of starting a business. If you want a deeper dive into the basics of starting a business, I do a webinar on that. I'm going to have one right after this, in fact. So your first uh, step is to figure out what your corporate structure or what, what the business entity of your business is going to be. Are you going to be a sole proprietor, a partnership, uh, or a corporation, a limited liability corporation? Uh, and if you're anything but a sole proprietor or a partnership, you need to register that business with the Secretary of State's office. There's usually a fee associated with it. But uh, say you're doing a pop-up, uh, you're, rent, you're renting a space, it might be outdoors, somebody twists their ankle, they want to sue you, uh, it might be a good idea to consider a limited liability corporation, limited partnership, something like that. More information could be found at the Secretary of State's office. After that, you need your federal employer identification number. You get this to the IRS. If you're a sole proprietor, you could use your social security number. But um, typically, banks make you have an EIN before you could open up a business bank account. Um, they're free to apply for. You do that through the IRS. Uh, it takes maybe 15 minutes, and it's easy to do. After that, you need your gross receipts tax ID number. You get that through the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department. They used to call it a CRS ID number. Now they call it a BTIN or a Business Taxpayer Identification Number. Um, you, it's free to apply. You do that through tap.state.nm.us. Uh, but and you, you got to keep in mind that 
you have a gross receipts tax requirement whenever you sell products. You Wherever you sell those products, there's going to be a different gross receipts tax rate. If you want more information, the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department has a great webinar just about gross receipts taxes. And before you could get your business license or a temporary business license, you need a gross receipts tax ID number. And let me tell you, these business licenses, if you want a temporary one, I think they charge you per day. Uh, it's like $15. A full business license, as you could see on the sheet, is between $20 and $45, $25 and $45. It might be more to your benefit just to get the full business license. And these you have to renew yearly. Once you get your gross receipts tax ID number, you that's the number for the rest of your business. Same with the federal employer identification number. And you only have to register your corporation or your LLC one time. And there's only one fee, but the business license, you'll have um, continuous fees with that. So that's what I wanted to tell you about a quick uh, tutorial about the business start process. So this means um, you have to create very uh, good working relationships with your local government in your chosen area. And then I have some examples of pop-up shops. The the best example and the that comes to my mind uh, being raised in Albuquerque is the Spirit Halloween store. I grew up just off of Montgomery and San Mateo. And there was a free there was a, a free space like that open there was a big uh, shopping center and there would often be a place where there was no shops, an empty storefront. And they would pop up in that storefront during the holiday season. And then after the holiday season, they go away, but they always have an online presence where you could uh, shop for even collectibles. And they have I think they've gone beyond even Halloween. Ooh, these are pretty creepy things. So the Spirit Halloween store is probably the, the most uh, familiar to me. So West Elm, what West Elm is, is they're an online furniture retailer. And they tend to deal in more high-end furniture, aka expensive furniture. And they uh, they teamed up with Macy's. And if you're old like me, you remember whenever you went to a department store like Macy's, they had a furniture department. They sold vacuums. They sold camera. They sold everything back in the day. Now they tend to just sell clothes. So they teamed up with West Elm. West Elm put some furniture in their store for sale. Uh, it was a great partnership. They had similar target markets, usually women with high incomes. And uh, I think that was a great idea for a pop-up. Mene, M-E-N-E, -E, they um, sell 24 karat gold jewelry as an investment. So it's not only jewelry, it's an investment. Um, and they teamed up with Selfridges, which is like the Macy's of Canada and, and uh, England. And uh, they took their jewelry in, as a pop-up into those places. And uh, I think that was a great partnership. And then let's see here. Yeah. Oh, the most appetizing of my pop-ups are is the uh, Cheetos pop-up restaurant. And this was more of an advertising campaign than it was a pop-up shop. But Cheetos paid uh, a famous chef to make recipes uh, using Cheetos and they offered them for sale in that pop-up storefront for a certain amount of time. And that what they were really trying to do there is advertise in a certain area. This happens to be the Tribeca area of New York. They had a, there was a free storefront, so they took advantage of that. But if you were gonna do something like this, a pop-up restaurant, I'm gonna talk about food trucks later too. You would need to get approval from the uh, New Mexico Environment Department. They're the ones that issue permits for food service. And that would take a lot of time and planning. So think about that. But it's a great way to test a business idea on a temporary basis. Let's go back to our slides. And just like with pop-up shops, food trucks and carts are permitting intensive and require great logistic skills. In order to operate a food truck, you'll need to be in compliance with the New Mexico, Depart the New Mexico Environment Department as a mobile kitchen. And this requires using a commercial kitchen as a commissary. After that, you have to find a commercial space to park your food truck. And this means contacting property owners or managers, creating a contract to lease the space, and then consistently parking in that area. If you don't lease 
if you don't have a business address, you can't get a temporary or full business license in the municipality or county. So say you have a restaurant located in Albuquerque, you want to have a food truck in uh, Los Lunas, you have to rent a piece of commercial space, take that lease over to the um, the courthouse where, where they do the business licenses if the, you're in the county. Uh, you go to the police station if you're in the, the city proper. And um, they will issue you a business license, but they will always ask you, do you have, per they will always find, figure out if you are actually leasing a commercial space, if that space is a commercial space, and if you have the authority to operate a business on that space, which could create some hiccups for you if if, uh, if you don't have that those things in line. This type of distribution is a great way for testing a new product uh, or for, for an established brand or testing a location for a new business. It's important to make good working relationships with your chosen areas planning and zoning department because they could make or break a, a business idea. I mentioned target market earlier and you need to draw awareness to your new business and this means promotion. How are you gonna reach your target market, especially if you're on more than one location? Do you need a website? Do you want, need to use social media? Um, do you wanna do a postcard mailing? It depends on the market research you do and your, the target markets you serve. So if, say you were gonna sell like high-end French pastries, you might wanna do a, a mailing to people in, with incomes of a 100,000 or more who live in that area where you wanna park and um, have an interest in gourmet food. And I could, I, in that data Excel, I could actually pull a list like that. And then I have some examples of food trucks. My last food truck, Crazy Dave's, he used to sell hamburgers. He since now does landscaping. So I can't use him as an example anymore. The one that I see most often is Sanchez Tacos. They actually park on Main Street in Los Unas. And uh, they have a website, a web presence. So you could go to that uh, website all the time. You could see where they're located. You could see their business hours. Um, and they actually list their menu online. I think this is a, a, a great business model. I think Sanchez Tacos, they do a great job. Um, so think about that. Just, just because you have a truck, what do you have to do in addition to having that business? This business is basically an online business because it has a presence all the time online. If you don't want to do all that, you could also like... Um, with Love Waffles, let me show you that example. They just have, they don't have a website. They just have a Facebook page. And they post lovely photos of their food. Oh, let's see, yeah, it was Valentine's Day was probably a big day with, for them. And uh, they make candies and waffles. The waffles look absolutely delicious. And they have a truck where they go around and you could also just have a Facebook page like this and promote your business through Facebook. But you have to have some sort of 24 hour presence, even if you have a pop up or a food truck. Let's go back to our slides. Okay, I talked about the research tools earlier. Let's see, I'm, I'm good on time. Let me show you Ibis World, which is where I got that target market for women's clothing and uh, Data Excel. And I have access through UNM libraries because I'm an employee. I could log in with my UNM ID number. Uh, all of our SBDCs have access to this. You won't have access. You have to actually make a meeting with this. So this is a great time for me to open that door and tell you, reach out to your local SBDC if you want to support. I have a meeting with them. IBIS World, my favorite database is IBIS World. The hardest part about using this is logging in. And I know there are gonna be probably a lot of questions because we're covering so much in one webinar. So I wanna leave at least 10, 15 minutes for quick Q and A. So I was always using uh, restaurants as an example for this, but 
uh, one of my fellow business advisors says, why don't you use online sales since you're talking about online sales? So let's pull a report for e-commerce and online auctions in the US. And I like to go over the full report. I don't like to view it online. I like to view it as a PDF. Sometimes we could send you the full report. Sometimes we have to send you just an abbreviated report depending on our restrictions. And this report is about e-commerce and online auctions and it was put together in October of 21. So they're, they're pretty recent. They don't let them go over a year usually unless they're a very niche industry. And I'll go over the high points with you. So let's see what the ex key external drivers are. I also like to call these the key economic drivers because it's really what's happening in the economy. So the percent of business conducted online, yeah, as that goes up, you'll see more business. Internet traffic volume, for sure. Number of mobile internet connections and per capita disposable income. I'll tell you who your suppliers are. Let's see. Synthetic fiber manufacturing, that's a weird one. Cardboard box and container, container manufacturing. When I sold on eBay, I would always, uh, I, uh, I would go to places where they would throw away boxes and I would find a different array of boxes and I would promote it as 100% uh, recycled cardboard packaging. Uh, and it was a way for me to be cheap without having to buy these boxes. Now I just buy them on, on Uline, uh, but they're pretty expensive. Plastic and resin manufacturing. Postal service, yeah, for sure. And then who are our first and second tier buyers? Consumers in the U.S. Hobby and toy stores in the U.S. That's an interesting one. And educational services in the U.S. Consumer electronic stores in the U.S. That's an interesting one. Computer stores, that's an interesting one. And office supply stores. So it looks like a, there's a lot of small manufacturing businesses based on hobby and toys, educational services, computers, electronics, and supply uh, office supplies. These drivers, it tells us which ones are growing, staying the same, and it looks like online sales uh, between 2016 and 2021, all the drivers were going way up. Revenue in that industry is slated to grow 8.6% up until 2026, so probably a great time to enter this industry. Profit in this industry, they didn't uh, guess on what it's going to be, but it looks like it's on an upward trend. Profit margin in this industry is 5.7%, so almost six cents out of every dollar you make in the business goes into the business's profit. And growth was down uh, very slightly. The number of businesses in this industry is slated to grow 10.5% up until 2026. Employment has the same trend and so does wages. This report will tell us what products and service segmentations do best for online stores, computers, electronics, and appliances a big one, clothing, footwear, and accessories, another big one, and home and office. So these are the, the biggest, the top three sellers of what people buy online. It gives you the SWOT analysis, with the, which is the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It gives you a lot of narrative about the industry, it tells you what the industry is doing compared to the external drivers. So as the number of internet traffic went up, revenue went up, and the percent of business conducted online went up. Ooh, that's There's the pandemic right there. Let's see where this business is in the business life cycle. It's in the quantity growth phase, which means it's probably a great time to enter that market. There's the quality growth is in the green. Then we're in the mature market. If you're in the mature market, you're competing against businesses eight years who, that have been in businesses business eight years or more. If your business is in the decline, that means more businesses like yours are closing than opening. But this one's in the quantity growth. More businesses like this will pop up in this uh, online auction and an e-commerce market. Tells you again uh, what products do very well. Other merchandise, clothing and footwear and accessories for sure. Then you don't have to worry about shoplifting. It's very hard to shoplift over the internet, let me tell you. Major markets for this industry include consumers uh, under age 34. So that's 38.4% of the market. So if I was going to do an advertising campaign, how could I advertise my products to consumers under the age of 34? 
And then we have some other markets. And the, the one surprised me, the third largest market, consumers age 55 and older. So d don't uh, um, discount your the older population for shopping online, for sure. And I think they're uh, generally an uh, overlooked audience. And then we could see our cost structures and benchmarks. So if we're going to do uh, financial projections for a, a business plan, say you wanted to do an online store, this is the Risk Management Association data that tells us that most of the stores in this area spend this much on wages, purchases, and whatnot. So that's IBIS World. Let me show you Reference USA. Reference USA is a great market research tool. So let's do the businesses database first. And I always do an advanced search with my clients. Very rarely could I do a quick search, unless I was looking for a very specific business. So say I wanted to, uh, say I made uh, like uh, craft kits and I wanted to sell those to toy and hobby stores, which you, which you saw was a major market for online sales. Let's see, uh, there's a lot of manufacturing in here. Let's use a, an example that's a little bit easier. I like to use the example, we had a star client in 2017, Valencia Flour Mill. They are a flour mill in Jarales, New Mexico. And they couldn't compete selling just flour because of gold medal, uh, all the other major um, uh, flour mills. So they mill um, local flour from New Mexico in Jarales, New Mexico, and they use that flour to create just add water mixes for sopapillas and blue corn and muffin mixes. Their target market would be uh, restaurants that sell sopapillas. So we want to do restaurants, and maybe we could find an X code for even um, Mexican restaurants, maybe. Yeah, we could find an X code for Mexican restaurants. They are not a national company, they're a New Mexico company. So they probably want would want to find those um, restaurants in New Mexico only. And here's a list of restaurant, Mexican restaurants in New Mexico uh, that they could sell their products to. So how can you contact these people? You could definitely call them because they're business. You could call the businesses. You cannot call the consumers. You could send them a postcard. Um, and then if you open up these, like let's see, Arima, Mexico. If you open up their profile, I could give you more information. Say you want to start a restaurant. This one doesn't have any sales volume. Let's open up one with sales volume. Aralitas restaurant. Let's say you wanted to open up a restaurant. Where, where's this restaurant located? In Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, we were going to do financial projections so you could get a loan to buy a location. We know that this restaurant, your restaurant's going to be just like this one. They make 597000 a year. Take that with a grain of salt. And we could start to create financial projections based on that. But let's go back to the marketing uh, aspects of it. So let's go to the consumer lifestyles, which most of us on the call right now probably uh, will use. Let's find those. We use that example of a of food truck selling gourmet food. Say we wanted to, oh, our food truck's going to be parked in Valencia County. That's where Los Lunas is. And it's always last on the list. So I, that's why I like to choose that. Uh, we want to contact one person per household. We want to contact those uh, households that have an estimated household income of 100,000 or more. We could definitely find those. 
say I'm going to have a pop-up shop. We could find uh, selling women's Western wear. We could uh, target women. Let's see, we have gender. I can't do that on this database, but I have another login for the SBDC I could do, use that with. And then uh, they have cooking and they have gourmet food and wine. We're going to sell uh, French pastries and wine out of a food truck. That sounds delicious. Gosh, I didn't expect so there's to be so many households in that met that, made, met that criteria in Valencia County. So there's a 1,072, and it actually gives you the names and addresses for these people. It could it will also give you a phone number and e an email address if it's available. It tells you if your telephone numbers displayed may be on the do not call list and should not be used for solicitation. You could call them if you buy the list through ref, uh, Data Excel. And what, the last time I checked, it was uh, $1,000 for 5,000 contacts. You're welcome to mail these people. So if you wanted to send a postcard uh, to all these people, letting them know that you're going to have your gourmet food truck in Valencia County, uh, I could pull that list and you could send them postcards, you could send them letters. That's how we get junk mail as uh, individuals. Okay, I went over the major ones. Uh, if you wanna know more, put the, put it in the chat and if we have time, I could go over uh, something like Mintel or Census Business Builder with you. So many people come to my office and tell me social media marketing is gonna change their business outcomes, but that's far from the truth. I want to show you the who, what, when, why, or why about social media marketing by concentrating on Facebook, since that's what I'm most familiar with. But I want to warn you, before you do any online marketing or promotion, uh, make sure to do your market research your target and identify your target markets. So let me open up the NMSBDC Facebook page, and I'll show you a little bit about the Facebook boosts which is how you uh, pay Facebook to advertise your business to customers that meet certain criteria. Let me log in. And the hardest part of using any of these things is logging in. And I have two-factor authentication on my Facebook account, which means I get a text message. Let's see what that is. Okay. We are in. I'm usually logged in right away, but I didn't log in this time. Most of the Small Business Development Center. Let me bring that here. So you're seeing what it looks like to have a Facebook page, a Facebook business page. And then I've shared this recently. It had a lot of people reach. Look, 4,806 people were reached by this. 27 people shared. It's about the uh, free file uh, tax help New Mexico that's happening at uh, UNM Valencia campus. And say I wanted to promote that to small businesses in Valencia County or another audience, I could boost that post. And then they ask me what kind of button I want. Do I want them to call me? Do I want them to visit my website? Most likely, uh, the people online with me now 
are going to want people to shop now. And then I could put a link to my store. And then it gives you audiences here. And, and it says smart audience. That doesn't mean very much to me. Uh, oh, I would, uh, if this is Facebook will customize your audience to meet more people. I like to use those IBIS world reports so I could create an audience. If I was selling women's Western wear, it'd probably be women um, 35 to 55. in uh, Valencia, uh, say I wanted to target um, all of New Mexico, I could do that. I could target, I had an address there plus 30 miles, I could do that for sure. There's New Mexico. I could target zip codes, I could target neighborhoods. Uh, you could get really precise in, in your advertising there. And then my favorite part of about this is, the detailed targeting and don't tell me how facebook knows this but they could find people say who are interested in in food and people who uh, like to visit uh, food and restaurant page admins if you were targeting those business owners uh food and restaurant demographics you could target people in income households and the top 25 to 50 percent of zip codes all the you know you could target all the income levels there you could target a uh, people with an interest in women's clothing and then you could do an ad for say if you sold a product that was for both men and women you could target men with a certain ad and you could target women with a certain ad and then you could save that audience and then you pick a um, duration for your ad. Say I wanted to advertise this for seven days. You could create a budget. Your budget has to be a dollar per day. So if I chose seven days, I have to have at least a $7 budget. And as you could see, it skips seven, goes right to eight. <laughs> and then it tells you how many people could be reached. So that's how many people are actually clicking that shop now button. Uh, per, I think, yeah, daily uh, with that ad. And as you, as you increase the budget, watch, let me increase this budget. And you could see the number of people reached increases too. And it tells you the reach. So these are people viewing it and these are people clicking it. So the more uh, you put in, into the budget, the more people will probably click your link. So if I only invested, say, $30 in an ad that ran seven days, that's pretty cheap. I could have 44 to 128 people actually click that shop now. So if I was selling online, 44 people going to my store to shop now, that could mean um, my store staying afloat. Okay, that's Facebook uh, boost right there for you. They also have a uh, facebook.com slash business where they offer free learning modules on how to actually use Facebook Boost. And if you're new to one of these social media sites, they always have these free videos on how to learn how to use their paid services. So I have some other awesome resources here. My favorite and most practical is Google My Business. Remember I told you they give you a free uh, rudimentary website. And let me show you that. I'll show you our... Uh, we, we claimed our location for the NMS or for the uh, Los Unas SBDC. Oh, I'm not signed in. Let me sign in. Again, the hardest part of using these websites is remembering your login. Okay. 
So the address is google.com slash business. And this is what it looks like to claim your Google My Business profile. It, tell, it gives you an, uh, information on how many people have viewed your business, what they, how they viewed it, have they asked for a phone number, have they asked for directions. Let's view it on the search. So this is actually what you're claiming right here. It's this little profile on the right side of the screen. We, you could collect reviews and respond to reviews. You could uh, put in more information about your business. If you're a restaurant, you could put in a menu. If, uh, say, you live in a rural area of New Mexico, like most of us do, they often don't have the address correct. You could correct where the address location is. Like this, we're not at 280 La Entrada anymore. We're actually at uh, uh, 1020 Huning Ranch in Los Unas. And then you could put posts. And what posts are, they're small little informational advertisements about, um, about your business. And Google My Business really likes you to put posts and they're helpful. So if you were gonna have a coupon here, say you're a food truck, you're gonna be in a certain location for an event, you could put a post there, visit us at this event. And here's the website. We have our own website already, so I don't publish this, but if you wanted this rudimentary website, it's based on the information you enter. They, it's absolutely free and they give you a URL, but you could also, they sell URLs, so you could also buy one Los Unos de Small Business Development Center, sbdc.com, and for $12 a year, which is pretty reasonable. And it connects right away to this website. Um, cool ways to do it. Again, if you sell products online, you could enter those products over here and tell Google where to send people for those products. If you, um, um, you can't really list your sales website on, on this website, but you could list the website to find these products on this products area. If you were a restaurant or a food truck, definitely you could create a menu that people could see on uh, Google My Business, which I highly recommend. And I, I could help you with all that. I'm a Google My Business partner, so I'm uh, pretty versed in do, using that website. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is Social Media Examiner. It's a video blog that features social media marketing experts and gives great advice. Uh, New Mexico Internet Entrepreneurs is a Facebook group created by Barb Tomlin as a forum for New Mexico entrepreneurs to connect and get helpful tips and post new ideas. The New Mexico Small Business Development Center website and the Small Business Administration website uh, they have numerous free learning opportunities, useful articles, great documents. So visit these websites and take advantage of their resources. The New Mexico Bar Association, remember I, I wanted to give you a resource to find an attorney. They're actually called the State Bar of New Mexico now. They under, they've undergone a, a branding change. And they keep a database of attorneys who passed the bar exam in New Mexico. And it allows you to search by locations and practice area. And then finally, the one I'll recommend here is the New Mexico Council of Governments. We in Albuquerque metro area, we're the Rio Grande Council of Governments. Every segment of New Mexico have, has a different Council of Governments, but all of them publish traffic counts data. So if I wanted to see how many people pass a certain stretch of Main Street in Los Unas uh, on the daily or uh, average weekly traffic counts, they have that listed on the Council of Governments website. I mentioned the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department. They offer great webinars on gross receipts tax. That might be something you really want to consider as an online vendor. And the IRS has a self-employed tax center, and that could give you information about um, uh, all your federal tax liabilities. And when you're selling on these online marketplaces, they often refer to that as the gig economy, or maybe you're an independent contractor on uh, Fiverr. Uh, there's tax, you still have to collect and pay your taxes. And a lot of times, uh, especially uh, I ran into this problem, you don't expect to pay taxes selling on an online marketplace. But if you sell over $600 worth of stuff on an online marketplace, even if you don't have a business, you will get a 1099 and you will have to pay taxes on the income you received. And that could, you know, if you made just a little bit of money off of the things you sold, that could really cut into your profits. And it's something you have to plan for, for sure. Let's see. 
Since this is a COVID-sponsored webinar, I included this slide, which gives you the most up-to-date links on how to operate a business during COVID. And then how we measure our success together. Now that we talked about how we can help you, this is how you could help the SBDC. And as part of offering our services, we need your help to ensure we're around for many more years to come. So we ask that you participate in our surveys, report economic impacts because of our assistance to your business advisor or center director, and uh, write a letter of support to your local legislators about your experience with the SBDC. All the information we collect is confidential and is only reported in aggregate to the state of New Mexico and the Small Business Administration. We went over lots of information, so let's review what we learned. Market research and planning is important. You now have the resources you need to make better educated marketing decisions. So take an hour each month or do it one time a year, one time a quarter to use the SBA's marketing uh, plan worksheets to make a plan and identify your target markets because they might have changed or the needs and wants of your target market might have changed. Know your target markets. This is the least you must do before you spend any time or money on promotional activities. Ask yourself if you have the skills to set up and manage an online store. And now that you know the major activities involved, does this seem like something you can or want to do? Uh, did you think online selling was so labor intensive? Now you know. So do you have the staff to answer customer questions, ship and handle returns, especially if you already have a storefront? If you wanna start an online store, are you able to meet the state, municipal, county, and tax requirements for your venture? Those are very important to plan for. And most importantly, are you prepared to handle the extra cleaning requirements, mandatory capacity limits, and ever-changing regulations for pu our public safety? Uh, if you have a pop-up shop that's gonna open for two weeks, but has to close for a month because of somebody tested positive for COVID-19, could you handle that? It's better to know what you're up against before you get into it than have to close for two weeks because somebody tested positive for COVID. This slide provides contact information for SBDC programs PTAC, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, and it's a government funded program providing assistance to small businesses who wanna sell their goods or services to the government, educational institutions or tribal entities. The International Business Accelerator, which is a one-stop shop of resources for New Mexican businesses and individuals wishing to introduce their product or service into the global market. And the New Mexico Tech Technology Commercialization Accelerator offers no cost confidential counseling regarded in, regarding intellectual property. And when setting up an online business, remember you're advertising to the nation. If somebody has a federal trademark on that business name in the same category, you might get into trouble. Uh, our, new, our TCA could help you look up those copyrights for logos, business names, and whatnot. So take advantage of their services. This slide contains the list of small business resource partners score or the service executives. West or the Women's Business Center program, and VBOC or the Veterans Business Outreach Center. So these are other programs funded by the SBA. And here's the contact information for your small business support team. We are funded by the SBA and many people ask us about SBA loans. I put a link here to our SBA resource guide, but that's been down. Uh, I let the SBA know about that. And uh, as soon as that link becomes available again, uh, I should make that uh, a searchable link and I, I'll uh, try to email all the clients when it's back up. The SBA doesn't lend directly, but they offer loan guarantee programs. Uh, and the specifics of these programs can be found on the SBA website. And this concludes our slideshow. I'm gonna open it up for questions now. Uh, I think I left about 10 minutes. I'm gonna open up our participants. If you wanna type a question into the Q&A, do so. Um, if you wanna speak, I'm gonna lower everybody's hand, but if you'd like to speak, you could raise your hand and uh, I'll uh, allow you to speak. So I got, let me look at the chat. Oops, see, whenever I click, I move all those slides, okay. Uh, Fernando asks, are there any good sources or training for Google ads marketing? Oh, Fernando, be careful what you wish for there. 
if you sign up for Google My Business, they um, that's one of the best things you could do for learning more about Google Ads. And that's google.com slash business or business.google.com. And they actually give you a voucher for uh, like four or $500 worth of fr free Google ads. Um, let's see. Let me find a good one that's free. Google has a skill shop at Master the Google Tools Use It Work for free online training. I'm going to chat over this. I knew they had a skills page. I'm going to chat this over to everyone. And if you want to learn more about any of the Google products, there's that place where you get free uh, Google training. Yeah, and they have one on Google Ads. And then I had a question earlier. If, is, if somebody, okay, let's see. If someone is working for me and lives out of state, can they join NMSBDC webinars? They can join SBDC webinars for sure, but they will get end up eventually getting an email from me asking what center they should go to. So um, have them sign up at the center closest to them if they're from Texas, Clovis, or Hobbs. If they're from Colorado, probably our center in Tucumcari or Española. And if they're from Arizona, probably Gallup. And then if uh, if they're out of the country in Mexico, we have our center in, in uh, Silver City. So they'll have them sign up at the centers nearest them. And I got a comment. Zoom does not allow copying of the links in the chat. I'm sorry, Seamus. Uh, it does that to me sometimes too. I wish I could. I wish I could change that. But uh, I hope some of the the links I sent you are pretty uh, short. And remember, all the major links that I covered in the slideshow are on that follow up email that I gave everybody access to with the with the web address. But that web address will you won't be able to access it on the web once I send it out. Again, me clicking and moving the slides. Let's look at the Q and A. Brian asks, "What was the link for the free Adobe images? They're not free um, on Adobe. That's Adobe stock. And let me see what that URL is. It's stock.adobe.com, and I'll put that in the chat." The one mentioned in the comments was Upsplash. And they said that one was free. It's free. Upsplash. I'm going to put that one in the chat for everybody. William asks, I built a website uh, for an artist painter in Albuquerque. Any tips on a website for an artist painter in Albuquerque? William, uh, if you built one already, mm, good for you. Good for you. I think it's, it's nice. Uh, I would recommend just getting the free one from Google My Business. I have a, another client. She loves me. I, she allows me to share her website. PCGallegosArt.com. She's an artist. And this is an example of a website created through Google My Business uh, for an artist. And I think, and she doesn't, she doesn't sell through her own website. She sells through third-party website marketplaces, or you could call her. And um, if that's what you're doing, I think getting a free, a free Google website would probably be your best bet. Claiming your presence on Google My Business by going to google.com slash business, that would probably be my biggest tip for you. It's hard to get found as a small website using lots of keywords related to your art. So if you were an impressionistic artist, impressionism, using those keywords that would attract people to what you do. So those are my three biggest tips for you. Let's look at the chat. Let me get rid of this.
Oh, uh, Rose suggested that you take a picture of the URLs in the in the chat. That's a great idea, Rose. Actually, I'm going to take that one from you and use that one. <laughs> and I'm here with you guys. Remember, if you want to speak, raise your hand and I'll allow you to speak. William, let me allow you to talk. You're allowed to talk, you're on mute, unmute, and you could speak. Thank you, I just wanted to say thank you for a great presentation and thank you for that information on the artist. I just built a website, yeah, it's KGS Painter uh, Paints. Let us see, KGS, I can't even remember now, but anyway, it's KGS Paintings. Dot com and uh, this is a great website and uh, that was a great tip for Google and I'll keep that in mind that it's good to use third party uh, and, and Google to try to drive some interest in the paintings. Uh, we, we haven't really finished the website yet, but it's getting there. <laughs> and thanks again. No, no problem. Uh, when you're creating a website, make sure you visit our, our TCA, our Technology Commercialization Accelerator, and look for those businesses that might have a similar name to you. Um, definitely claim your, your, your Google My Business page and collect reviews, because the more reviews you have, the, for, the further up in the search you'll appear. So, William, thank you for the thank you, and take some of those tips. Let's see, I got a Q&A. So with Google My Business, do you already, per, uh, do you already purchase your domain, et cetera, before you claim your page? So you could purchase, a do if you already own a domain, you could connect it to that free website. If you want to, you don't even have to put that website up. They give you a free domain, which is .business.site, whatever your business's name is, .business.site, or you could purchase a, a URL or a web address straight from Google for $12 a year. So that's what that one is. Thank you for Claire, asking a little bit about that. Let's see in the chat. Okay, thank you, Seamus. Yeah, reach out to me. I'll be happy to meet with you. And you're free to go if you don't have any questions. I'll stay uh, until the bitter end with you guys. And remember, if you want to speak, you could go ahead and do that by raising your hand. I have. Okay, William, go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I live right here by the uh, Valencia campus, UNM. Is that where you're located, or oh. where, where, where can I meet with you? We're at the Workforce Training Center. So we're, we're in a new location. We're at 1020 Huning Ranch. And uh, if you know where the, they just built the, the Maverick gas station down by Walmart, if you turn and head south where that Maverick gas station is, we're at the end of the road. So that's where our new location is. And it, actually, it's a very nice, convenient location, except... William, don't make a meeting with me after two because traffic is horrible on Highway 6 after two. Try to make a morning meeting with me. And I could do Zoom as well if you wanted to do a video conference. Hey, thank you. No problem. And then I have a Q&A. Thank you. Well, thank you for the thank you. Thank you, Sandy. And we're almost there. I don't think we have time for any more questions, but you, uh, let me go back to that very first slide. Move this down a bit. There's my email address. There's my phone number. And that phone number actually changed. It's 8980. Let me... Uh, and if you want to uh, get in touch with me, the best way to do that is to call me. I get a lot of emails every day, so uh, you, it might take me a few days to get in touch with you via email. 
But again, I want to thank you all for spending time with me. It's 11 o'clock now. I have to get to my basic steps webinar in just a bit. Hope to see you all again. And remember, reach out to your local SPDC and uh, get some of those IBIS World or uh, Reference USA reports. Bye for now.